we talk a lot about climate change, but climate change is a very long term um, change in average temperatures around the world. The thing that really affects ecosystems in the shorter term are the extreme weather events that are a result of that climate change. And this project seeks to get right into the heart of that question. The Nature Conservancy has people working on the ground in those um, locations, on the ground in the Amazon. Um, they've been there for many years. They've been studying uh, these, um, uh, these ecosystems in detail. They've been working on the important issues of what, uh, how best to do reforestation. Um, what's the impact on human behavior of changes in weather conditions um, at the margins of the Amazon between the agricultural communities uh, and the, the wilderness, um, wilderness forest of the Amazon. And it's this combination of the science, the broad base of science from the Oxford Martin School and the on the ground um, capability of the Nature Conservancy that is a unique uh, and very, very important partnership. If we want to change the trajectory of climate change that we think it's going to take, um, one of the most important things we need to do is to stop cutting down our trees. So there are large tracts of forest that are kind of stores for carbon and um, reducing that rate of deforestation will be one of the easiest ways in which to make sure that we can move on to a more sustainable path. Brazil's quite forward thinking in terms of reforestation um, and for example both in the Atlantic forest and also in the Amazon, they have quite large-scale programs that they're implementing to um, incentivise farmers to put some of their land aside for trees to grow either naturally or to plant them. The problem with that is that um, as you incentivise someone to change their land use, you change the costs and the profits that they can make from that land. So as you put that land aside, the land market might actually shift in the, in the region, it becomes more and more expensive to reforest. So how do you incentivise people so that the right people reforest and so that that reforestation is sustainable and uh, cost effective in the long run? That's what we're talking about in this project. My part of the project will explore and try and simulate how the Amazon rainforest responds to extreme climate events. Now we know that tropical forests play a big part in affecting many aspects of the climate, both through the water cycle and the carbon cycle. And one of the most important uncertainties in how the world will change under climate change is how the tropical forests and other parts of the biosphere will start, whether, whether they'll start releasing carbon to the atmosphere and be accelerators of climate change. One of the, the big challenges that we face in predicting the impacts of climate change on the biosphere is that it isn't the average temperature or the average rainfall that matters in, in determining the future, it's the extreme events, those rare droughts that may occur every year or every three years or every ten years, and it's the frequency and intensity of these rare events that matter. And one of the challenges we faced is that our climate models up till now haven't been very good at simulating the probability of these rare events, and our biosphere models haven't been very good at simulating the impact of those extreme events. And in this project, we're going to make advances on both of those. The interesting thing over the last few years is that there have been three strong droughts in, in the Amazon forest in 2005, in 2010, and currently with the El Nino of 2015, 2016. And in our previous work, we've set up a network of observations across the Amazon forest that have tracked the impact of these droughts on the actual Amazon forest at sites right, ranging right across the Amazon. My part or our part of the project is um, the climate modelling side of things. So we are in this project in the initial phase, we are interested in droughts in the Amazon forest primarily. So usually climate models and complex climate models like the ones we are using, so so-called GCMs, global circulation models, um, they are usually run on supercomputers. But we run our model on volunteers' private computers. So in a project called Weather at Home, we, uh, we ask members of the public, and we always need more participants, um, we ask them to simulate, to run our models on their computers. And with that, we are able to have very large ensembles. Because for us, basically, the computing time is for free because it's donated by our participants. And with that, we are able to have much larger ensembles and are really able to look into very extreme events, which you can't do when you have only supercomputer runs.
We link weather to climate change in that we ask what is possible weather in the world we live in, so in, in a world that has already changed. And then we so remove the climate change signal. So the, the greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, but also the human-induced aerosols from the atmosphere and try to simulate what we call a natural world. So what would the weather have been like without climate change? And in comparing these two worlds, we can, if they are different, so if the, if, and they are, sometimes they are not, but in some cases they are different, then we can link this difference to the anthropogenic climate change.